Okay, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Uh, we are here today to learn more about the community resiliency model from Linda Gravy and Elaine miller Karras. My name is Madison Hammett. I'm with the Illinois ACES Response Collaborative. And I am gonna get us started with our intro slides here. So, here we go. Uh, so as you can see, this is part of our burnout and well-being webinar series. This is the second edition of it. And we are going to I see y'all all see my, my notes here now too. So sorry about that. Um, we are going to hear from Elaine and Lindy today on the community resilience model. This is the second part. Or last month, we heard from Laura Altman and Audrey Stillerman on clinician burnout or wellness. And next month, we'll be hearing from Aggie Stewart on integrating yoga as a trauma-informed wellness practice for uh, staff and preventing burnout. How could <laughs> Health and Medicine is the home of the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative, and as you can see, we are a uh, policy research group that works to improve the health of all people in Illinois by promoting health equity. The the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative's mission is to catalyze a cross-sector movement to prevent trauma and promote thriving across the lifespan. And we do that through capacity building, policy and advocacy, and research translation and dissemination. So you're going to get a little bit of that, uh, all three of those things today with this webinar. After the webinar, you'll receive an evaluation survey, ways that you can participate in the collaborative, links to our website. And then you'll also get a recording of this presentation and a link to register for our next webinar um, with Aggie. You'll also get a PDF of the slides. Oh, oh we're jumping ahead. We're so excited. Uh, if you have any questions you would like to ask our speakers during the webinar, you can do so on the side. You'll see on my screen, you can see where you type in questions. I'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar, and uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, uh, I will introduce our speakers. Dr. Linda Gravy is a board-certified family nurse practitioner and psychiatric slash mental health nurse practitioner. She is a clinical assistant professor at Emory University's Neil Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing. Her interests include trauma-informed care and the neurobiology of trauma and resilience, social justice, and the social determinants of mental health. Her clinical expertise is primary care and mental health care for homeless or incarcerated women and youth, providing the community resilience model training to these populations in group settings. Ms. miller Terrace is a founding member of the International Transformational Resilience Coalition and a an leading advocate with regard to the impact of climate change on the human condition. She is a senior consultant at Emory University's SEE Learning Program, and she has contributed to trauma-informed and resiliency chapters in curriculum based upon the community resilience model. She is also faculty at Loma Linda University School of Social Work and has traveled internationally uh, with the community resilience model. So without further ado, Lindy and Elaine, I am gonna switch the presenter over to you and uh, we will be able to see your slides and go from there. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. So we are changing presenter over to you. Be able to see their screen now. So if you will just click share screen. Let's see. Can y'all hear us over there? There we go. Yes, Thank you. Hear you. All so, set. Welcome. I'm yeah. Linda Harris. And my name is Linda Grabby. And we'll be co-piloting this presentation today um, to give you some of the basic um, concepts of the community resiliency model and also share, to share some of the research that Lindy Grabby has been doing to, as we build our evidence uh, base in, in the model. So I'm going to start out and I think I just have to go here with a brief introduction is that the community resiliency model is it teaches a set of six wellness skills and these and the wellness skills 
can help return the body back into mind, body, spirit once it has experienced a very stressful event or a traumatic event. The model is based on current neuroscience, so we like to interweave what I call neuroscience nuggets into our trainings. And one of the exciting things about the community resiliency model for us is that it's an intervention that actually can be used across the lifespan. So we can help children, adolescents, adults, families, and communities in the aftermath of um, human-made and natural disasters. But I think the, another exciting part is that it can be used as prevention. So we are um, launching actually a new part of our organization that deals with prevention so that communities can bring the model in so that they can be well prepared when some of these very unfortunate events may happen in communities. The other thing that we do in the community resiliency model is you know, there are many people who struggle with mental health challenges around the world, um, including in our own country. Many of them may not be attracted to go to psychotherapy, but oftentimes we have seen that there are natural leaders of communities that already um, respond to the mental health needs of their society. They may be lay persons, ministers, teachers, first responders. So our model invites natural leaders of communities to become community resiliency model teachers. In fact, we're in Atlanta right now uh, with a classroom full of wonderful individuals who are natural leaders of a community from Atlanta, from North Carolina, Florida, um, who are learning uh, how to become a teacher. So we also have seen where this model is very affordable, accessible, portable, and adaptable. And it can be a standalone um, set of wellness skills, and it can also be inter integrated into other kinds of um, um, trainings that help to create greater resiliency in communities. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So one of the, um, the things that I'm the most pa passionate about regarding the model is being part of, of a perspective shift in society. And I think that if you look at this slide, the first slide says conventional thinking, which has been that, well, people are bad. People need to be punished. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with that person? And what's been exciting for many of us when the trauma-informed concept started spreading around the country is it brought to light that people are suffering. People need to learn how trauma impacts a child's and adult's development. And the very important question became, what happened to you? And of course, that has sparked a whole set of new interventions and social policy to how do we help children and adults who have experienced trauma in their life. So what we think that we add to the equation, and this is a part that the, our organization has added, is resiliency informed or focus. So we have seen as we've gone around the world that even when very difficult things happen to people, that our adversity doesn't necessarily have to uh, um, be our destiny so that people are resilient. They need to learn how skills of well-being can reduce suffering. And we ask the questions, well, what is right about you? What, what are your strengths? You know, what gives you the courage to get through um, the tough things that you've experienced in life? So when we shift our thinking toward what moves people to, to create change and also to acknowledge their strengths, there's a new conversation that, that comes forth. So many of people have asked us, well, you know, resiliency is kind of an overword used, uh, overused word right now. Um, we often start our trainings by asking people what they think resiliency means. And sometimes it has um, a very positive um, definition and sometimes not so positive. So we have found that we want to get all those definitions on the table first, but we have our own. And resiliency is an individual and community's ability to identify and use individual and collective strengths in living fully with compassion in the present moment and to thrive while managing the activities of daily living. So people often ask us, well, who can be helped by the community resiliency model? So I've already mentioned that it can be used across the lifespan, but we've also brought this model to, um, actually what I can say because it's integrated into other kinds of programs, it's been brought to 102 countries around the world so far. Um, so it can be used across cultures because we all have a nervous system that responds in very similar ways when we have stressful and traumatic things happen to us. And there are ways that we can start focusing on our well-being 
which the uh, is built into the wellness skills that can start paying attention to well-being. We also have seen, because we know that there are many different literacy levels, not only in our own communities here in the United States, but in the world, that it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have, whether you can read or write, that you can learn the skills of the mind. So uh, I think everybody who's listening is uh, watching the news and checking the Center for Disease Control's website about the coronavirus. So as of yesterday, um, this was the map, and of course it's encroaching and changing every day. So there is a lot of um, fear and stigma and anxiety around um, COVID-19. Uh, and we believe that uh, using the community resiliency model skills, uh, we can handle the anxiety and fear better. So we're actually gonna explain some skills that you may be able to use today and share with some other people. Uh, there is a research base that's forming around this. Um, this is a study that was in Sierra Leone after the Ebola crisis where they trained uh, community uh, members in this model and they had significant improvements in resiliency along with some uh, reduced trauma symptoms, secondary traumatic stress, depression, and anxiety. So uh, this is the study that we did here at Emory with nurses um, and we found that out of a group of um, actually the 200 nurses who uh, signed up for this study, a third of them had some pretty remarkable low well-being and uh, possible PTSD, lots of somatic symptoms, sort of the physical symptoms that come along with stress and anxiety and uh, trauma and then burnout. And then uh, we had, um, this was a randomized control trial, the first one of the community resiliency model. And one year later, the nurses in the uh, resiliency group had a very lar a large effect size for improved well-being. They had reduced secondary traumatic stress and physical symptoms. And so we were very excited about this. This was only a three hour class. And when the nurses came, they did not know what they were getting besides it was a nurse wellness class. So I want to explain um, what we use um, as a cornerstone concept of the, the model. So this is the resilient zone. So this, everybody's got this internal state where they feel like their best selves. And uh, it, this wavy line actually reflects the um, action going on in our nervous system, the automatic nervous system. And you can think of those as the um, accelerator and the brakes. Um, the sympathetic accelerator is when we need energy and we expend energy. And then the downslope is when we're in the parasympathetic or brakes mode to restore our energy. So we have an ebb and flow every day, all day long, that is quite natural. Uh, and then when we're in that zone, we are best able to think clearly and work with other people, learn. Um, and, uh, but it's not always, um, it's not like a happy zone exactly. You could be happy, but you can see all of these different emotions. But as long as you're staying in your zone, uh, you can still function okay. So but all of those emotions are going to occur. And then um, the skills that we teach actually um, widen the zone. So people do have varying um, widths in their resilient zone um, naturally. And some people fortunately have nice big wide zones. And through the skills that we teach, we believe that you can widen your zone over time so that you're more resistant to stress and less likely to get bounced out. Now, all of us are gonna have a narrower zone if we're hungry or tired during pain. So explaining that to people sort of normalizes it. We also have um, times where we, our nervous system becomes overwhelmed. It's just too much. Now that could be um, a sudden event, but it could also be cumulative over time. So it throws off the nervous system and we can get too much of either the accelerator or the brakes. 
so we can be thrust outside the zone. So if we have too much of the accelerator, then we tend to be uh, irritable, um, sort of angry, anxious, and so on. And if we get um, thrown out, we can be stuck out there actually on high. So it's a hyper aroused state. And I think if we begin to notice within ourselves sensations, then we, even knowing that we're in, in or outside of our zone can help us to get back in. Now we also get pushed out on low. So that's the um, hypo aroused state. And though that would be sort of the slowness, sadness, can't get out of bed, fatigue, even feeling cut off and numb. And people get stuck in the low zone. So the techniques we teach are ways to get back into the zone. It does not feel good to be outside of our zone. It's uncomfortable. And so uh, people do various things to get back in their zone, which sometimes are counterproductive, like drinking alcohol uh, and uh, engaging in violence even. So one of the um, important concepts of the model is the idea that um, we focus on the biology of the human nervous system. And this is what binds us as a world community. So we have the, um, this expression of it's, it's, not, it's not that you're mentally weak. You have had a common biological reaction to a highly stressful or traumatic event. And we ask six questions as we go around the world. You know, How has this affected you emotionally, physically, spiritually, behaviorally, within your relationships? Um, and the physical part is a very important part because oftentimes people don't connect that there are physical manifestations from stress and trauma. And I know that if we have um, family practice providers, nurse practitioners, or people that work in primary care, you know that this very well as people come in with different um, symptoms. I can't sleep, my stomach hurts. And oftentimes it's connected to their lived experience of life. So what we have tried to do within um, the model is help people understand the connection between their lived experience and the manifestations that happens as a result of the biology of the body and how we're designed. So we help people learn how to read their nervous system. So once they learn how to read their nervous system and they, cannot, they can pay attention to their sensations of well-being, this begins to shift their lived biological experience and it also tends to shift how they think about what's happening to them in their life because the mind and body are very, as many of you know who are listening, they're integrated and one depends on the other. So the model is based on laws of nature. So there are natural rhythms in nature that exist not only in the seasons and the, in the cycles of the moon and if we're by the ocean, how the ocean waves come and they um, recede from the shore, but we also have rhythms that exist within our nervous system. And for those of us that have experienced a lot of stress and trauma in our bodies, sometimes we can feel like we are trapped by the storms and by the sensations of discomfort and distress. And that's what we, where we have to live for the rest of our lives. But what we've learned with the model, and for some people, and we've been teaching this for three days here in Atlanta, it can be very novel to say, oh, what else is true? I have sensations of well-being. Oh, we're experiencing those sensations of well-being. Sometimes it's as simple as saying, oh, I can feel it in my legs and my feet. Well, what would happen if you drew your attention to your legs and your feet right now? Let's see what happens. And oftentimes when we pay attention to our sensations of well-being, people are very surprised to see that their sensations of discomfort will leave them or become less. And so that is one of the things that we say to them, well, guess what? The brain has a lifelong capacity to change and rewire itself. So the more that you, you, you pay attention to your sensations, sensations of well-being, the more that you're creating these new pathways that could actually change your life and also change your reactivity to the stresses or the reminders of past traumas that sometimes have derailed us and taken us out of our best part of ourselves to bring forward. We also talk about not only neuroplasticity, that the brain can change, but also neurogenesis. And there's a growing body of evidence that many of you may know about that we um, have the ability to create new neurons throughout our lifetime and new connections. 
Um, Lindy already mentioned about the autonomic nervous system, but you know, many of us, um, even if we're trained in medicine, we, we know we learn about the structures of the body and their relationships to one another and what the functions are, but many people in regular society may not know about that. So that when we help people learn, and this is probably one of the most important things I'm gonna to say today in this little webinar, is when we help people learn to tell the difference between sensations of distress and well-being, we then have a choice of what to pay attention to. And that can change the way we walk through our life. So here is a very simple little diagram talking about the accelerator and the brake. Um, it's very straightforward. But sometimes there are some people who've had so many things happen in their life. When they get stuck in that high zone, that they're always experiencing their heart rate is breathing fast. And they're always feeling a certain sense of tension and distress. And maybe even their digestion um, shuts down and they're not feeling so well in their body. So when we help people learn that there's another part of their nervous system called the parasympathetic with break, that, oh, what, what happens when you think about, oh, that time that you went to the ocean and you saw the waves and it was a beautiful day. Sometimes in the present moment, you'll see them absolutely immediately take a deeper breath and they start experiencing their well-being. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we introduce you briefly to the skills of the model. But this is a, an important paradigm for people to learn how to begin to start paying attention to their sensations of distress. And I want to give you a teeny example of what happened today. We've been talking about the coronavirus and one of the people in the, in the uh, workshop shared that she was a part of a university system where she had to deal with having to make some big changes. And she felt that she now knew that she was in her high zone. And when I asked her what she was experiencing, she said, oh, my heart rate is so fast. So we asked her, what do you think would help you get through this right now? And then she gave us her response, which um, she started talking about what she had control over and what she didn't. And we started asking her about the skills she immediately noticed that her heart rate slowed down. And she'd just been in the training for three days. She goes, oh my, she said, I can tell the difference between the distress and the well-being. And by the time we ended the conversation, which was maybe like seven minutes long, she now was no longer in her high zone. She was in her zone of well-being or the resilient zone or okay zone is what we call it. So it's the, the skills are simple. And when people learn to do this, and I think this is when Lindy talks more about her study, I think once you learn it, you stick with it and it becomes part of your activities of daily living. So that's why it's so important for every single one of us to apply our resiliency mask on first. And of course, I see someone here that's on an airplane, which is kind of, can be a little bit challenging for people right now with the, the virus going on. But we need to put on that, uh, our you work with our skills and bring ourselves to that zone of well-being before we stop, start helping others. And that's why this is so important for self-care for those of us that are in the helping professions. So uh, if we start seeing our responses to stress and trauma as biologic events in the, in the body, what we're suggesting is that we need biologic um, tools to counteract some of those uh, responses. So there's a lot of stress sources. So um, this slide shows uh, in the tree the 10 ACE, ACEs, uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences, that's so well studied now, and you all know what those are, uh, abuse and neglect and family dysfunction. But the community variables have been added um, over the last several years. So that these are considered ACEs, um, uh, racism, community violence, uh, you know, all, these are the social determinants of health. And then um, the climate change, and currently with the pandemic, this is a, this is a huge thing that's going to affect everybody. So um, I like to uh, explain that the health impact pyramid, which is uh, Tom Creighton developed, uh, is a handy way of uh, taking a look at where uh, the community resiliency model Balls. So at the top, you have the labor-intensive sorts of things like one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy. Uh, and then way down at the bottom, you have a much bigger impact, but those things are harder to change. So those are things like the 
uh, poverty and, and housing and, and harder to change, but bigger impact if we're able to do that. But we do have in the middle there, in the blue, long-lasting protective interventions. And uh, while the examples here are medical, uh, we have a psychological uh, model here, which once you teach somebody, they should be able to practice it at no cost to anybody because the resources come from within and they can be very preventative and, and protective. And that's what we need uh, in any of the helping professions, but then to be able to share them with our clients is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. All right, that came up fast. So we're going to introduce you to um, to some of the skills. Of course, in an hour, we can't teach them all to you, but we're going to give you a little bit of an idea of what these skills are to help you understand this, um, how they may be helpful for you. So the very first um, skill, which we use with all the skills, is called tracking. But really what we're doing is we're reading the sensations of the body, and tracking is the foundation. So as we pay attention to what is happening on the inside. So when I told you about the participant, she noticed her heart rate being fast. She said, oh, I'm in my high zone. That's the moment of choice. Does she want to stay there? But she has some very concrete skills now that she can use with intention in order to change that physiological state that improves her well-being. So I like to think about that we have three do doorways of expanding our well-being, how we think, sometimes we say, well, maybe I need to change my thinking. Maybe that's a distorted thought that I have. But, and we have feeling, we often ask them, well, what are you feeling about that? Well, um, as I express the feeling, maybe that would help me to feel better. But we've often left out the very important doorway that I put in the middle, I made it red, <laughs> that is sensing. What are you sensing on the inside? So this is a, the portal that we've left out of the equation that is a very important part of this model. We need to learn how to read our nervous system, and we'll talk some about the the uh, research that's coming out about interoceptive awareness that um, is another fancier way of talking about sensing. So what we pay attention to grows, and that is what we've seen over and over. And when and there's another part about when we put what we pay attention to grows, and that's based on scientific research about resiliency, brain cells that fire together, wire together. And I often use this um, metaphor. I travel all over the world teaching this. I've been to many countries. And most countries, there are people that have gardens. And when you have a garden and you want to, let's say you want to um, uh, grow some vegetables in your garden. And but there's usually, I always ask the question, are there weeds? Are there weeds in Illinois? I think probably so. There are def definitely weeds in California and Atlanta, I think, aren't they? Um, so, what, what would happen if we decided, as we were trying to grow those vegetables that were about our nourishment, that we only watered the weeds? Well, what we've had the answer to that that I've heard over and over again is that, well, the weeds would grow and maybe our vegetables would not. So this is why we say we pay attention to the sensations of well-being, because what we want to do is expand that well-being within the nervous system. And this is what we've seen when we say, oh, we've seen people that have very narrow resili resilience zone that now have a more ample one because they've invested into their, uh, their sensations of well-being. And Lindy will talk in just a little bit about the research study that she did, which was one of the first randomized control trials that we had that evidenced this. Okay, so where is all this action happening? So um, actually, if you look at the brain there, the little green um, uh, piece of brain material is um, the, called the insula, deeply embedded in the brain between the hemispheres, but it is part of the cortex, actually. So it is uh, connects from the brain stem, and it's surrounded by the limbic system, and then it has pathways to the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate. So, but this is the hub of interoception. So when you notice in your body anxiety and you actually localize it, maybe characterize it, say I have a tickly feeling at the top of my diaphragm when I'm anxious, <clears throat> that is registering uh, in those pathways. So, but this is also the center for some other important things besides uh, uh, cell body awareness. So, 
actually, this is where we sense that we need to get to sleep or eat something or go to the bathroom, but we can also sort of cultivate, cultivate this capacity to sense into our body, and it can have very powerful implications. But this hub is engaged in other facets like emotion regulation, empathy, social interaction, uh, and sense of self. So th those are all so powerful, and that's what we hope to be self-regulated, emotionally regulated, and that we hope we can teach to other people too. So um, we can use this interoception, which is awareness of internal sensations, extraoceptions through the senses, which is also important in this model, but interoception, uh, you may not be able to notice particularly very much, but we do have receptors in our uh, joints, in our organs, in our muscles, and we can sort of start reading our body. And this model is all about listening to the body, uh, and it can be quite powerful. So we think that when you practice uh, the, these skills, that it can develop some of these connections, reinforce them, and perhaps counteract some of the negative default ways of thinking that we have. So <clears throat> this uh, was a piece of research done in Europe and in Asia, so multicultural, uh, and the people drew uh, areas of act activation in their body with yellow and red, and deactivation in blue. And the black areas are neutral. So uh, they were shown, the subjects, the 700 of them, were shown something that would in induce some anxiety or contempt, pride, shame, and so on. And they actually drew on computer screens where they felt activation or deactivation. So uh, uh, this just goes to show that this is somewhat universal and that when we feel angry, there's a place in the body that we can notice it. But by noticing it and maybe naming it, then we can shift out of it, possibly. So the point is that um, we intend to um, emphasize here, noticing the differences between sensations of distress and then sensations of well-being, knowing that difference. And then we can have a choice about what we're going to pay attention to on the inside. So how do we track? So tracking is noticing or paying attention to what is happening inside your body at the present moment. So we ask the question, they're curiosity questions. What do you notice on the inside? And also we want to see what you think about these sensations. Are they pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? So that is where we, that's where we start um, when we're trying to develop this, um, this greater awareness practice of reading our nervous system. So we've learned as we've taken this around the world that one of the best ways to learn about reading the nervous system is through our second skill, which is about developing our resources. So I will, so a resource um, is any person, place, thing, memory. Um, it can be a beautiful place in nature. It can be, you know, a beloved person. Um, it can be real or imagined. And it can be internal or external. And when I say real or imagined, there are people that sometimes we ask about you know, what is what's something that uplifts them, that makes them feel calmer, gives them joy, strength, or courage. Sometimes there's some people that can't think of anything. So then we might ask them, well, can you imagine, you know, what that may, may be like? Or maybe you've seen a character in a book or a movie. And most, most of the time, people can uh, identify a resource. Um, and when we talk about internal, sometimes people will say, well, I think I'm a very compassionate person or I have courage, and go, where do you notice that on the inside? So it's more of a trait or an attribute, or sometimes they'll say, oh, I have very strong legs. I love to hike and I climb mountains. So not only do we learn about their, strike, their strong legs, but another resource of hiking and looking at beautiful scenery. Now in this particular picture, I have to say that that beautiful little girl is my granddaughter. Um, her name is Madison, and if I look at her as I'm looking at her now, I have an experience that kind of comes from head to toe. Um, Lindy can tell you, am I, am I smiling right now? Mm -hmm. I actually feel a little bit of warmth. Um, she is certainly some, a little being that likes my life. 
And there's sometimes when I'm stressed, I just kind of close my eyes and think of her. Although I don't have to even close my eyes, I can keep them open. And I feel that sense of well-being. So that's showing you in a very, very simple way how we might use a resource to pay attention to our sensations of well-being. We, we really encourage people to think about many resources, though, because sometimes uh, one resource may not be as effective on a certain day of your life and another resource might be very powerful. So I would just add that when you do uh, develop a resource, it's uh, wonderful to share it with somebody else. I think it concretizes it, if, if it's, yeah, it validates it. Well, I'm just wondering, um, Linda, can you tell me about one of your resources right now? Oh. I think we have time. Well, you know, it was when I was seven, something comes back to me, and I really? remember being at the beach with my family. So you were at the beach, you remember which beach you were, where you're here in? It was Baja California, Baja, California. but I can remember the sound of the surf, very loud, and the smell of the salt air. And the salt air. And can you can you see the family members too yes. that were with you? Right. So I'm wondering if, as you as you brought up that image, what are you aware of happening on the inside? Well, it's kind of um, solid feeling in my trunk. A solid feeling. So I'm just wondering. I know that you can put your hands together in a particular way. Do you think you could bring your attention to that solid feeling in your trunk? Sure. And just see what happens as you do that. So what happens? Oh yeah, she's a big smile on her face, sitting right next to me. Also, her face has become a little bit, a little bit ruddy, just a little bit of flesh. Oh. You said swarm in your face. I do. Yeah, I you do. do. My she goodness. just resourced. I just resourced, resourced her, and we do this all the time with our our friends and our colleagues, right? If we're getting a little bummed out. So it's kind of like being with a friend who's telling you something that's important, and you have a genuine curiosity. But then, if we're doing it in with Krim. We're going to say, what do you notice as you're talking about that in your body? And that even firms it up more. The more sensory information you can have about a resource, the more powerful it is. And, and can I add, and the reason why we call it community resiliency model is because when she actually was telling me about the beach, telling me about the smells and being with her family, and I could see that smile, and she said she felt solid. There was also a little deeper breath there. I didn't call your attention okay. to that, but there was. You know what happened to me? I felt the same. So there was this little shared sense of well-being that we had with each other. And we also integrate the concept of mirror neurons. Right. That when we have those mirror neurons firing in one person of well-being, it also can fire in us as well. So now we have a community of, of, uh, of resiliency. So that's one of our concepts as well. So the next skill is grounding, and you may be using this already, but um, again, this is something you can just pay more attention to. For example, as you walk, you can notice the sensation of the floor under your feet. And uh, it's all about um, contact, surface contact. So you could ground on the tabletop, noticing the smoothness, the temperature, um, the sharpness of the edge, but I can also ground on my clothing. It's a little ripply where I'm touching it, but soft, or my skin, and perhaps it's a little um, uh, moist and um, um, soft, for example, but you can ground in many different positions. So when I wake up at night and I can't sleep, I ground on the pillow. And if any of you have ever flipped the pillow over in the middle of the night to get the cool on your neck, you're using Prim, the community <laughs> resiliency model already. But lean into it and you know really enjoy that. Um, but you can ground on um, the sheet, the blanket. It just um, is uh, one of our very important resiliency skills, as you'll see. And can I add a little bit on that? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we've learned as we've gone around the world is not everyone can ground sitting in a chair, for example. I've learned grounding with other things that I've been trained through my lifetime. But the difference between this grounding and other grounding is that we ask people, what are they noticing on the inside as they get into the comfortable position of their choice? And I think choice is very important. The other thing we don't do is we don't say, close your eyes. We can say, you can leave your eyes open or closed whatever is the most comfortable for you, because this is a trauma-informed model as well. And we have learned when people are sometimes instructed to close their eyes, they can go into a traumatic flashback. 
And so this is a way to avoid that. But I think the other thing I want everyone to know is that whenever you create something, you stand on the shoulders of other people that have come before you. And Dr. Jean Ayers, who was an occupational therapist, she was the first one that I read who said, gravitational security is important. And that means if we always feel like we're floating or the world is spinning, which sometimes happens to us as children or adults who've experienced abuse or car accident, earthquakes, that reestablishing that gravitational security is really important. Right, so, and we only engage in these skills to the extent that we are comfortable. I want to mention one other thing about interoception, and that is that uh, some people can't feel very much in their body, can't sense too much, but you know what? You can always sense your muscle tension or your um, maybe your heart rate and your breathing. So those are ways that we can kind of tra track. All right, so help now uh, is the skill of um, you need it in the immediacy of the situation. So uh, if you notice you're outside your resiliency zone or somebody you work with it, who is, there are quite a few things that you could do. You could say, I, I, you know, I can see you're upset. Would you be willing to try this with me? Um, can we walk and count our steps? Uh, can you name colors that you see right here in this room? That allows for a reset of the nervous system and even though it's a very, very brief intervention, it's kind of a mix of tracking and grounding. The one that's very potent is pushing up against the wall. So that could be with your hand, it could be with your back, it could be with your forearms, but it engages the large muscle groups. And we've actually seen this in children that little kids uh, like to use this too as a way of regaining control. And some of you may have already used some of these little um, um, strategies when you work with people. So they're not novel. But I think what we've done is we've tried to put it like in a menu. And certainly there are 10 here. We probably could have come up with 200. But we find that these are very used um, throughout the world, especially as, as Lindy said, with kids. Okay, so we want to talk about what research there is. And we already said that the um, RCT with Emory nurses showed a rather powerful in effect on their well-being and reduced secondary traumatic stress. So they only got a three-hour class with no booster sessions. Um, we did ask them to listen to iChill, which is the free app that goes with this model. So um, in their uh, answers, we asked them what all skills were they using and then when. So they were actually using these three, tracking, resourcing, grounding. Here's help now, pushing up against the wall, grounding on a ring, fabric of the scrubs, noticing, the, again, the textures of things. It gives your brain a little moment there to readjust. Um, visualizing the hand brain model, which is a three part brain model, because when, if you consider this the cortex, uh, when you're outside your resiliency zone, the cortex is offline. So for that nurse, that helped a lot. Um, and then when did they use it? So it was amazing during um, chaos, clinical, uh, scary clinical and stressful situation, when it was hectic, difficult family dynamics, when I'm anxious and unsettled, even during codes and with dying patients or after a difficult shift, maybe walking to the parking structure, but noticing the support of the asphalt under sh the shoes. Um, and then one nurse actually identified uh, their um, actual body reading. So uh, rapid heart rate, uh, heavy breathing and sweating. So when she noticed that, that gave her some control. It gave her some power, maybe to shift into a more resilient place. So this is the iChill app, um, which is free. We're going to be actually updating it by, I think maybe by the end of next week, it will be a different color. We also just, um, it will also be in Spanish. So um, most of our materials, I think we've translated our materials so far in 17 languages. Um, we have many Spanish speakers in California where our, our institute is located. We also, um, these are the different places. I and mean, there's actually more countries that we've been, but it gives you an idea. Uh, we also have an association with the C Learning Program for, from Emory, and they have, uh, they have brought this to many places in the world as chapter two of their C Learning Program. 
and also um, my book called Building Resilience to Trauma, the Trauma and Community Resiliency Models was chosen by the online curated li library by the United Nations as one of the books that uh, lends to the support of their, their call to action to end poverty, fight inequality and injustice and protect the planet. This is a completely free portal and I really um, encourage you to take a look at the different um, writings that they have there that can um, contribute to this. Um, our Trauma Resource Institute, where you know you can get us in many different, we can tweet and Instagram and all that kind of stuff that my staff does, not me. And um, this is also our vision to create resiliency-informed and trauma-informed individuals and communities. And we really have a commitment to bring these wellness skills to people one person at a time. And this slot, this uh, image was uh, drawn by a young man named Ernest in Rwanda, and he brings this to many people who may not be. Uh, may not be able to read and write, but you can see that you can actually he has drawn the images of the skills and I love this for that reason. So this is the information about the C learning program. Also, it's a completely free program that brings social and emotional learning and um, our community resiliency model skills to the world's children. You can go on it today and, and get free materials. And then our, our really our, I'm just going to read, you can see I really appreciate the Dalai Lama, that if we can um, really, our compassion cannot be limited to those who look like us or who share our citizenship. It really needs to be extended to encompass everyone on the basis of our common humanity. And um, one of the things that I often say in our nonprofit is diversity, inclusion, would be a world where people of all religions, race, races, sexual orientation and gender identification were equally respected, included, and welcomed because we all have a nervous system and it reacts in the same way. Okay. So I think now it's questions. Whoops. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, uh, folks, uh, like I said, it is question time. So uh, if you have anything that you would like to ask Wendy and Elaine, please feel free to type it into your question box and I will be facilitating. Just to get us started off, we had a question about integration into practice, and uh, if y'all could give some examples around uh, that. I know you talked about the Emory study. Are there any more where you have seen this uh, put into practice, particularly around healthcare workers? Well, I can give you an example that with a with a client, <clears throat> she. Uh, she was I asked her was she using her resiliency skills and she said yes she said that she was um, having a really bad migraine and um, so she shifted her attention to her feet and I said oh so your feet didn't feel bad and she said oh no they hurt too but they didn't hurt as bad but it made my migraine better so we've also had the uh, model integrated into um, pain clinics. And so, in fact, one pain clinic, what they did, they had the human body where people would have to come in for their assessment and they would mark where they're experiencing pain. Well, one of our CRIM teachers did another body right next to it and said, where do you not experience pain? And she said, oh my gosh, it just opened up a whole conversation. We're so focused in healthcare about where you are feeling pain that it was, well, you really want to know where I'm not experiencing? Let me stop for a second. So again, this is one of the ways that you can integrate it into a, a primary care set, set, uh, setting as well. I used to be um, a teacher of family medicine, which is some of these concepts really grew out of that experience. And certainly the physicians and, and nurse practitioners, et cetera, having to do a lot in a short period of time. Um, we, I taught this to our residents and interns, and we have many places around the country that do that as part of their training. Loma Linda is one, Fairfield University, and you're teaching it as well, aren't you, Lindy, here at Emory? We teach it to nursing students. And they give us lots of examples of how they integrate this into a very kind of short inter interaction that actually results pretty quickly in, in, in the patient starting to feel better sooner, at least for that moment, in terms of having even a place that maybe they're now um, using their prefrontal cortex because they were in their survival brain mode and they can have a discussion about how better to manage their health care. I think I can also suggest that anybody who's working in clinical situations right now that are stressful because of the pandemic, then I think it really calls for a lot of grounding 
either on the floor, the chair, surfaces, um, also tracking internal sensations. When you feel that nip of anxiety, uh, just notice where you feel it. But that just noticing is going to give you some control and then switch shift to somewhere else in your body that feels stronger and more resilient. Um, but then also um, try interspersing uh, resiliency questions within your interactions with um, clients and patients. For example, if you're asking uh, difficult questions from somebody who's very sick, you might say something like, what helps you get through times like this? Um, even um, is there somebody or something that brings you a sense of strength right now? So this is that shift in the paradigm we're sensitive to the trauma, but then also putting a new twist on it to bring out people's strength. Can you yeah, I would just like to say, I'd like to highlight that in yellow, what you just said. We, we have been in our organization to many of the crises of our country and in other countries, like you know, um, responding to the mass shootings, for example, and asking that question, what has helped you get through um, hard things in your life? People all of a sudden say, well, you know, my faith, or they could be almost anything. And it reminds them, and I say this over and over again, don't I, what else is true? Because there can be the trauma and the stress, but there's also something else that's true. So we have a whole, you know, I think, you know, 10 or 20 resiliency focused questions that you can integrate into any primary care setting or anything when somebody is having a difficult situation. But that one question, what helps you, what has helped you in the past get through hard times? Who or what is helping you now? Um, can also be a very important question to ask. Plus, um, if you have some time uh, with a client or with a coworker, you can always say, you know, I'd like to just try something I learned in this webinar, and I wonder if you could do this. Um, you know, if you think, can you come up with some, some a place or a person or a, a memory or an, that brings you a sense of peace and safety and calm? Give them a moment. And something emerges from inside uh, and um, allow them to talk about it, ask them some questions maybe about it. And if you see that they have a more relaxed posture, uh, if they've smiled perhaps, then you can say, what, what do you notice as you're talking about that on the inside of your body? And give them a chance. And you don't have to give them examples. You don't have to feed them ideas at all. This is always all about listening and staying one step behind. You know, I think one of the things that um, Lindy's reminding me of, and when we first did this in San Bernardino County, and people were doing these short interventions, and people say, I don't know what you just did, but I think I can't get any surface strike right now, but I feel better. <laughs> so you may be surprised that when we remind people of what else is true about them, and this it really is also reminding me of when we were in the Philippines after Typhoon Hunan, and we had some new crim teachers that we were scattered over Toklaban, um, one little lady said, you know, thank you for reminding me what I already knew but had forgotten. So I think this is another thing that we do, and it doesn't have to take a lot of time, and it really does give a sense of nurturing, compassionate support to people in times of distress. And Elaine has been in numerous disaster situations where people have lost their homes, some of their family members, but somehow she manages to help them find strength from within. And if they can get to that place, then they know they have hope and they know that they can feel better at another time in the future, which is extremely powerful. I think the model cultivates hope, actually. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will reach because, oh, I almost think I, I'm sensing some hope right now. I said, well, where does that land inside the body? Sometimes they'll point to their heart. And they'll point right here. And I said, well, just even it, even if it's small, notice that. But guess what? What you pay attention to grows. I feel it. And they'll take a breath. And when we take a deep parasympathetic breath, we feel more space inside the body. So we see that that also tends to feed to remember those things in our life that helps us get through. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions that I'm going to kind of combine because um, they are all sort of related to each other. So we talked a lot about uh, integrating it as a practitioner with clients, with patients, with the people we take care of. Um, 
a lot of folks have said, you know, this seems like it would be really great for uh, health professional trainees and those working uh, in the uh, client services or otherwise um, for themselves as well. Um, and another person asked about integrating it into meetings or integrating it into everyday work uh, for so has there been any um, uh, model or has there been any application of the model with the actual workers themselves and if oh, so yeah. beyond oh. your nursing uh, study and if so can you talk a little bit about their results and oh. how they came out of it yes so our trauma resource institute we deliver trainings all over the world now and we often get called by social service agencies, by um, different kinds of community-based organizations. For example, we just started a project with um, Los Angeles County's Mental Health, where they brought 25 amazing individuals from different stakeholder communities of Los Angeles to become crim teachers, including people that run the homeless shelters, that run um, LGBTQ centers, that work with refugees, that work with people that are um, monolingual, not only Spanish speaking, but other languages. So they have found it to be very helpful in integrating this into their work, not only for the workers, but for the clients that come to see them, because this is not an us versus them, this is a we. And we often say, oh, when I get, after my, when I get bumped out of my zone, it's helpful for me to do this. Do you have anything like that that you may able, be able to do for yourself? Um, we happen, for example, Lindy is very dedicated to the Covenant House here in Atlanta, and she took me there on Monday, and we were in a group of young people who were homeless, who were able to identify resources, and they told us about their favorite animal. So you think, oh, that's so simple. But that little simple intervention, you can see them smile, take a deeper breath, and if they're really in their survival brain, and they're not thinking very squarely, when they get into that place, you have an opportunity to talk about next steps. So we have seen this integrated into things. I'll, I'll tell you, I was in South Africa a few years ago, and I got an email from one of the people we had just trained, and she said, Elena, I want you to know that we just trained the, um, the game wardens at Kroger National Park who are very stressed and traumatized because of the poaching of the large animals. Now, in my you know, I live in California. In a million years, did I think this model was going to be used at Kroger National Park? So I am humbled and amazed at what people around the world tell me about how they're integrating this into different settings. And I'd like to add too that um, trauma-informed care uh, is out there now. Fortunately, after a 20-year gap, but uh, this is so critical, and it's all because of the ACE study. But then what? You know, so now we're trauma-informed. Now what? Well, here's this one tool, the, the community resiliency model, which is a little bit of an answer to that. So it's not good enough to be trauma, just trauma-informed. We also have to learn how to be resiliency-informed to protect ourselves and then to help other people as well. Thank you all so much. And uh, we still have questions rolling in. Um, so, but I do want to close with one, and I will say, folks, you will have a, a PDF of the slide and a recording of the webinar um, and contact information. So, if you have some lingering questions, please feel free to reach out. But one thing I wanted to uh, close with was, is there a way to get more training in this to deepen my skills? So, we have uh, quite a few yes, people who are yes, interested. Yes, yes, yes. So, actually, we now have a growing community in Columbus, Ohio. So we're going to be doing our full, our first CRIM teacher training in Columbus, Ohio. Um, but of course, we have to be aware of what's going on in the universe right now because it could be postponed depending on the coronavirus. But if you go to our www.traumaresourceinstitute.com website and click trainings, we have many public trainings as well as we do most of our trainings for agencies, so they wouldn't be listed, but I know we have one scheduled for North Carolina at the end of April, which probably will be postponed. But we have, I think the one in, um, oh my goodness, I don't know if it's it's June. It's, yeah, well, no, we have one in June in uh, Columbus, which hopefully will be out of this virus problem by then, but we'll have to see. But also we're planning to do another one here at Emory in the summer. And also um, we would be happy to come to Illinois. If you have enough people there that want to um, do a training there, we've already talked to Audrey a bit about the possibility of that. 
So I think that's always the best is to try to do one in your own community because then it's a le little bit less expensive because you don't have to pay for flights, et cetera. So, um, and we always do to teach in at least two people. Yeah, we teaching teams and, but you can go to our website. You can also send us an email through our, um, our, our website and we can get back to you regarding um, if you're thinking about you'd like to do this for your own organization. Great, thank you all so much. Well, we are at 11.01, so I wanna be respectful because I know everyone is busy these days. So uh, thank you both so very much. Uh, and thank you to our audience. We hope you will join us for our next session uh, to learn about integrating yoga into your uh, trauma-informed work and uh, preventing burnout. We will be sending out a follow-up email with a copy of the slides, a recording of the webinar, and a short survey. Elaine and Lindy, thank you so very much. Um, and thank you so much for having it. us. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. All right, knuckle up, girl. We did it. <laughs>